Paul Vermeersch has written three previous collections. His poems have been published in journals and anthologies here and abroad. His writing has also appeared in the Globe and Mail and been featured on CBC Radio. His latest poems make up the collection The Reinvention of the Human Hand. It's the poetry of the human body's experience of struggle for survival. Paul Vermeersch. Little one, you have mastered the arts of taking and giving. Even the tiniest crumb you take with the whole of yourself, enveloping it, creating a hollow place inside of you to keep it hidden, to keep it yours, until that place is empty again and it collapses in upon itself and the need to fill it returns and you take. But when you give, little one, there is no saint or savior who can match your generosity. Only you can give yourself twice, each to a different future, each from a single past. I even believed it was possible once to give and take the way you do, when the world seemed made of knives, and all I wanted was flesh, and all I felt was want. And the next poem I'm going to read um, is called Elegy for Paul Winchell. And for those of you who don't know who Paul Winchell was, and maybe even for those of you who have some idea who Paul Winchell was, I'll, I'll briefly tell you, Paul Winchell was a, 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 a well-known ventriloquist. He was also a, a voice actor for cartoons and um, uh, also quite famously an inventor. And as a ventriloquist, uh, he was host of the Paul Winchell Hour on television in the 50s and 60s, where he performed with his dummies uh, Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith. Uh, as a cartoon voice actor, he gave voice to uh, Muttley from Hanna-Barbera's Wacky Races, Gargamel from the Smurfs, and perhaps most uh, famously, he uh, provided the voice uh, of Tigger in the uh, Winnie the Pooh cartoons from <laughs> Yes, I thought. So, um, when Paul, oh, uh, and as an inventor, he invented the uh, see-through garter, the flameless cigarette lighter, and, uh, this, and this is true, I'm not kidding, the artificial heart. Um, and I always, it struck me that somebody who, for most of his career, um, uh, made it his practice to bring inanimate things to life with his voice, would in the end invent, invent something inanimate whose job it was to keep flesh and blood going. And uh, when he died, I felt the need to commemorate him with elegy for Paul Winchell. Which is more alive? A tiger at its kill? Or a child's plush tiger? Or a child's plush tiger in a storybook? Or an illustration of a child's plush tiger in a storybook. Why I am, of course, says the illustration of a child's plush tiger in a storybook. Can one improve on the love of Geppetto? Can one succeed where the great Oz failed? Which is more alive, a heart that aches and races, or an artificial heart? They are equal, says the little wooden man. They are equal. Thank you. J'imagine que notre prochain écrivain garde de doux souvenirs de cet événement. Il a remporté le prix Trillium 2001 avec son roman euh, Toronto, je t'aime. Avec son quatrième roman, Le 60e parallèle, il jette une lumière au reflet profondément humain. Il amène ses lecteurs très loin de Toronto, en effet, au nord canadien, à l'intérieur d'une population autochtone. C'est l'histoire de Marc, agent de la gendarmerie royale, qui découvre que certains secrets ne lui ont pas été révélés. Écoutons Didier Leclerc. Quand je suis de service la nuit, je ne ressens rien, aucune peur. Au contraire, j'ai l'impression que mes sens sont aiguisés et que mon esprit alerte et que mon esprit est alerte. Pourtant, il m'arrive parfois, après une nuit en service, de faire un cauchemar, toujours le même. 
Je suis sur le point de sortir de ma voiture pour questionner un individu à l'angle des rues Malcolm et Marble, dans un quartier surnommé Rainbow Town, parce qu'il est fréquent d'y entendre des coups de feu tirés juste pour rompre le silence de la nuit. Une fois la portière ouverte, j'entends une déflagration, puis je sens la déchirure au cou. Je m'affale sur la banquette avant et je souffre trop pour pouvoir alerter la station. Pas celle de Misty River, il n'y a personne à 3 heures du matin, celle de Yellowknife, qui alerterait mes collègues chez eux. Un homme est étendu par terre et c'est moi. Le vertige d'abord, puis je perds conscience. Dix minutes plus tard, je reviens à moi, mais toujours personne. Seul le flux de sang dans mes tempes m'indique que je ne suis pas encore mort. Mon agresseur doit être loin, me dis-je. Personne ne tente de me joindre. Il n'y a aucun gendarme à 3 heures du matin qui sait que je perds mon sang, que j'agonise. Allô, Yellowknife, répondez. J'essaye télépathiquement, mais en vain. Trente minutes sont passées. Mes yeux tentent de fixer l'horloge du tableau de bord. Lueur bleue dans une nuit froide. Enfin, quelqu'un remarque mon long silence. Yellowknife à Agent Finlay, répondez. Trop tard. Je ne suis plus de ce monde. Je me réveille en proie à la panique, le regard plongé dans une détresse abominable. Je me lève, bois un verre d'eau, retourne dans ma chambre et fais alors une petite prière. Pas pour moi, pour Christian Martin. Mon cauchemar est la réplique de ces derniers moments, il y a deux ans, un novembre glacial. L'enquête a confirmé que les secours sont arrivés trois quarts d'heure trop tard. Malgré la mort de Christian, on est toujours obligé de compter sur Yellowknife après minuit. Thank you, merci. Michael Winter, an award-winning author who has written a work of documentary fiction set in his native Newfoundland and based on a notorious crime and trial. It's an extraordinary account of the stabbing death of Donna Whalen and the coercion, denial, and fear that surfaced in the wake of her murder and tore her town apart. The book is called The Death of Donna Whalen. Please welcome Michael Winter. Clayton and Bertha sleep in the same room. That's Bertha's bedroom, her phone and clock, her lamp and teddy bear. That clock, the hands are sort of lime, it lights up in the nighttime. Do you want to take a loan of it for a night? When she got to the top of the stairs, Sheldon was snoring his head off. There was no light in his room. There's a white shear up to the window, and it's a long window, it's bright. You could almost go and take a bath without a light on, because it has two poles on the outside close to the house. The walls are white, the bedspread is white, the bed is white, the shear is white. Bertha got up during the night because this complaint that she has, you got a feeling that you can't hold. It's not worth going for, but still you got to go. It's a common thing with a woman with a large family. The first time she went, it was around 25 after 2. She saw Sheldon in bed and heard him snoring. If he had to have the bedroom door closed, she still would have heard him snoring, but she wouldn't have been able to see him. The bedroom door wasn't closed. She even told Sheldon that he could close it and how to hoist up the carpet. He said no, he didn't need it closed. At 3.45, Sheldon was in bed. The next time she got up, she went downstairs and it was 25 after 5 by her clock, but it was 6 o'clock by the clock downstairs. He was still in bed. This clock she got is always losing time. At six, she felt a bit hungry. She got to explain this sickness. This sickness is not something that you can't eat or anything. It's an aggravating feeling. She got a bowl of Special K. After that, she went back to bed and started feeling tired because she was awake off and on. But that's every night for her. That wasn't just that night. That's been going on for years. She got records to prove that. Now, throughout the night, it really wasn't sleep, or what she calls sleep is like catnaps. She goes to sleep and wakes up because they have the scanner on too, and she listened to that because it was fr a Friday night and her other son was downtown, Paul. She wanted to know where Paul was at downtown, and the scanner lets her know. Bertha's been getting very little sleep for the past six or seven years. She's under the care of a psychiatrist, and this is one of her problems. She don't sleep. She can get her files. She's on the go all night long. She had a few pills left over when she got them from the doctor, and she took them. She normally gets up at 2 o'clock in the morning and moves her furniture around and not go to bed at all. A few minutes sleep is good enough. You don't get a telegram saying you're going to get like this. This is just something comes over you. 
You're not a woman. You're not after having a big family. So you've got no idea what, what way this strikes you. Bertha knows that's the way it strikes her. She's had it over 27 years, and it's quite common in a woman after having children. You don't get no warning. It's not something that's going to kill you or you're going to die from it. It's quite tormenting. And you didn't have no children, so you don't know what you're talking about there. You'll have to go talk to a doctor. Thank you.